So in keeping with the technology development theme of the last few talks, uh, our next speaker is Jonathan Liu, and he's going to talk about systematic engineering of a temperature-optimized GAL4 UAS system for transcriptional control of gene expression. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry to make you read that title. We hadn't come up with a name for our system, and so you had to read that entire thing. But um, hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm from Paul Stumbers at Caltech. I want to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, I want to talk today about work that uh, a postdoc, Han Wang, and I have been doing to develop a temperature-robust GAL4 UAS system for C. elegans, which we've nicknamed CGAL. So in genetically tractable organisms, a fundamental uh, way we analyze gene function is to take a gene of interest, feed it to a promoter, introduce the transgene to an animal, and then assay for some sort of phenotype. Um, sometimes we're interested in one particular gene, and if it's widely expressed, ask what it contributes to a variety of cell types. Other times we're just more interested in one cell type, and we want to know the roles played by the genes that it expresses. Or more commonly, we're interested in some combination of the two. And if you just want to look at a couple of promoters and a couple of genes, this is perfectly feasible, but as uh, you look at more and more, this doesn't scale very well. And so this is particularly true if you want to look at uh, biology from a systems perspective or do you know, large-scale screens for uh, some, something you want to look at. So, as an example, if you're interested in 100 cell types and you want to look at 100 genes, that would be 10,000 constructs and injections, which I don't think anybody finds appealing. Um, but thankfully, there are easier ways to do things, uh, namely using bipartite gene expression systems, um, the first of which was GAL4, and it was uh, originally described in Drosophila. So here what you do is instead of coupling your promoter to the gene, you have your promoter drive the GAL4 gene, and this comprises your driver construct. And upstream of your gene of interest, you place a GAL4 binding site, which we call a UAS. This is your effector construct. In these animals, neither construct is active, but when you, after you cross them in the cross progeny, the promoter drives GAL4 which then binds to the UAS and expresses your gene of interest. So now things become a lot easier because you don't have to build every pairwise combination of uh, promoter and gene. All you have to do is build a GAL4 driver for all the promoters you're interested in studying um, and a UAS effector for all the genes you want to study. And this greatly reduces the amount of work you have to do, but in the end gets you the same result, which is very nice. So I've shown you one example of an advantage of a bipartite system. There are others. Um, one is that um, once these strains get built, they become standardized and reusable at reagents for the community. You don't have to worry about, if you want to recreate an expression pattern, you don't have to worry about, oh, did I clone the right promoter? Uh, injection concentration is my array or integration inserted in some weird site. And so as more and more strains get used, they get better documented and better described. And then it's easy to incorporate new tools. Um, if someone includes a new promoter, a new gene, or develops a new tool you want to use, it's very easy to build a new driver or effector and then incorporate that into existing strains. So um, GAL4 in, uh, has been adopted by a great many organisms, uh, but not C. elegans. And we think uh, we wanted to um, engineer and optimize the system so that we could use it in C. elegans. We looked at a couple of things. We looked at the activation domain, which is a protein domain that recruits transcriptional machinery. Uh, we played around with the UAS uh, copy number. And then we also took a look uh, at the uh, GAL4 DNA binding domain. And I'll walk you through what we did. So first, we look at the act activation domain. What we have here is the myo 2 promoter driving expression in pharyngeal muscles. Um, and we used a, oh, that looks terrible. OK. Um, we used a GFP effector as uh, a readout. And we tried two different domains, VP16 and VP64. VP16 is an activation domain from a human herpes virus. And VP64 is just four tandem copies of VP16. And when we look, we see that VP64, as you might guess, vastly outperforms VP16. That's about a seven-fold increase in expression. So we decided to use VP64 moving forward as our activation domain of choice. Next, we took a look at a UAS copy number. We looked at 5, 10, uh, 15, and 20. And we noticed that uh, with more copy number, um, there's a successive increase in gene expression up until about 15, and then it seems to saturate. So we decided to stick with uh, 15 uh, copies of EOS as our, uh, for our system. We also thought that um, temperature might be a factor to consider with our system, and that's because the original GAL4 gene comes from uh, cerevisiae, a uh, brewer's yeast, whose optimal growth temperature is in the range of 30 to 32 degrees. This is pretty far removed from the normal temperatures we cultivate C. elegans at, about 20 degrees. 
So we thought that if we could find a yeast with the GAL4 gene uh, whose optimal growth temperature was closer to C. elegans, that it might function better for our system. Uh, we found one and picked one. Uh, it's called Saccharomyces cujovzevi. We picked it in part because it's got a very difficult name to pronounce, but mostly because its optimal growth temperature is about 23 to 24 degrees, very close to C. elegans growth temperature. So we take a look at the protein. Um, this is an alignment. Uh, there's Cervicii on top and Cujovzevi on the bottom. Um, they're pretty similar, but you notice that there are differences, and we were hoping that these differences would impart uh, better function for a GAL4 UAS system. Importantly, though, um, all the residues that are critical for binding to the UAS are still conserved. They're highlighted in orange. So we were confident that it would still recognize the UAS and drive expression. And that turns out to be the case. Um, on the left here is the original Cerevisiae driver, and on the right is Cujovzevi. And you can see in pretty much every case, it seems to perform very well and better. Um, I can show you this better with quantitation. So as a benchmark here on the right is a direct uh, myo 2 gfp transcriptional fusion at 15, 20, and 25 degrees. And you can see it's pretty insensitive to temperature. On the left here in red um, is the Cerevisiae driver. And at 25, it, it does a good job. But at anything lower than that, the performance falls off drastically. In contrast, our Kudrivzevi driver does very well at 25 and maintains its performance across this temperature range in a range that I think is pretty comparable to the uh, direct fusion. So we've uh, played around with these three aspects of the, of the system. Um, when taken together, uh, we've given the name CGAL, C standing for C elegans and also for the system uh, working at cooler temperatures. And it's supposed to Meant to, it's supposed to be like seagull, like the bird, but um, we'll try and propagate that for it. Um, but we want to we show that you, know, you, can do, uh, you can use this for more than just expression in pharyngeal muscle and for more than just expression of GFP. So we wanted to look at multiple tissues and see if we do some rescue and exogenous transgene experiments. So we clone a variety of promoters and we found that it could express in a variety of tissues. This is intestine, body wall muscle, and a series of neurons. Um, I should note that uh, we, originally we got really weak neuronal expression and really, really bad uh, gut background gut fluorescence. And we found that we had to switch backbone vectors to get rid of that, and that's how we got these images. So if that's your field of study and you, you want to know more about that, come talk to us and I'll explain more about it. For gene rescue, uh, we decided to look at the defecation motor program. Um, every 60 seconds, uh, C. elegans defecates, and when it does, it performs this three-step program. The first step is a contraction of the posterior body, followed by an anterior body contraction, and then a final expulsion of intestinal contents. Um, this very last step is uh, well described. Um, we know that two GABAergic neurons are necessary, uh, sorry, mediate expulsion, DVB and AVL, which I haven't drawn in here. Um, in these two cells, there is a G-protein coupled receptor called AEX2, which is necessary for expulsion. Um, in response to its uh, ligand released by the intestine, it activates the two cells and causes downstream contraction of enteric muscles. And we wanted to study this system because there's a lot of different tissues involved, and we wanted to see if we could site-specifically rescue uh, AEX2 in the worm. So I'll take you through um, what we see. So an animal with wild-type AX2 performs an expulsion step every cycle. A uh, loss of function mutant for AX2 um, doesn't you can see almost no expulsions. When we introduce components of our GAL4 system, either a effector containing AEX2 wild-type cDNA or the GABAergic driver, neither component is able to rescue expulsion. Only the combination does. And we know this effect is pretty specific because if we express it in either the downstream cell type, the muscle, or the uh, upstream cell type, the intestine, neither is able to rescue expulsion. And I should mention that um, we picked this experiment because uh, we obtained, uh, this paper did the same experiment with uh, traditional direct uh, tr fusion um, constructs, and we obtained results that are almost identical. So we can see that it uh, can rescue um, native genes, and now we want to see if it and drive exogenous genes. So what we've done here is we've paired um, a GABAergic driver with chanrodopsin. And so what's going to happen is that um, in response to blue light, chanrodopsin is going to activate GABAergic cells. And what that does is it causes um, the worm to uh, freeze because all the body wall muscles relax. So we're going to show that real quick. Um, this is, here's the worm. He's just moving along. And when we hit him with the light, he stops moving, goes limp. 
And then once we remove the light stimulus, it goes back to locomoting. And this is just to show that um, with the effector alone, there's no, there's no effect. And uh, once you add both components, there's uh, robust and specific uh, driving of channel rhodopsin. So just to sort of summarize, we've optimized several uh, factors of our GAL4 UAS system, and then we've demonstrated its use in reporting in multiple tissues, site-specific rescue, and driving of transgenes. So overall, we've developed a system that we think will be pretty useful, and it will be um, pretty robust for people's experiments. Um, our lab is sort of in the process of actively building drivers. We've got um, a lot of the main tissues covered, um, some neuronal subtypes and some single cell types. Um, you'll, you'll notice there's a lot of neuro stuff on this. Um, we're just sort of, that's mostly just because we want to publish and we want to, and neuro is the easiest sort of uh, smallest subset of strains to build to publish with. But we, you know, you can use this for any driver or promoter you're interested in studying. Um, we have a variety of factors, um, fluorescent reporters, cell killing, a variety of neuronal activation, neural inhibi inhibition, calcium reporters. Um, we're looking next towards maybe cell biological factors. Um, and um, of course, we know we would love like a cDNA collection and so forth, but that's going to take a while. Um, looking forward, um, we're going to keep building, and um, this is where we would re really love to hear from the community. We want to know what do you guys want, what do you guys are excited about, and if you come talk to us, um, we we'd love to hear about um, the kinds of things you guys would want to build with us. Um, we have some really promising preliminary results with. Um, intersectional control using split drivers so that um, control is now under two promoters instead of one. And we have really good results with single copy insertion. So uh, we're hoping to combine that with either a transposase or CRISPR for more sophisticated driver construction or like gene trap techniques. A little farther back is um, inhibitory control using GAL80, uh, specifically Kujiv-Zevi GAL80. We have some plans for temporal control schemes and for um, perhaps light activated domains hopefully in the future. And we're always working on a, we're trying to figure out a good way to catalog everything so you guys can browse at your leisure and uh, see what you guys can order. And with that, um, I would like to thank, uh, of course, Paul, my enthusiastic PI. Han Wang was the uh, main driving force behind this project. Our various collaborators uh, for their expertise, members of the Sternberg Lab for their thoughts. Uh, special thanks to certain collaborators for reagents in their uh, uh, and their time. The imaging facility, as always, the CGC, and of course our funding sources. Thank you. I'll take questions. Hey. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, looked at the time lag, like the time lag of having to express GAL4 to then bind UAS and get gene expression versus uh, direct. You mean? Uh, like if you used a promoter to drive um, GFP mm -hmm. versus you use that promoter to drive GAL4 and then a UAS driving GFP, how, what's the time difference for GFP expression being visible? I don't think we ever... No, but I, no, because usually we just look at adult animals, and if there was a difference, uh, maybe we wouldn't catch it, but I don't, I don't imagine it to be that, that different. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Hey, so I have two questions. So the, the first one is you mentioned doing single copy insertions. Um, we've found when we do single copy insertions of tandem repeat constructs that we often get homologous recombination between the repeats, and so we can get things inserted, but the, the number of repeats seems to be sort of random and different between lines. Mm -hmm. have, have you observed that, or is that something that you're worried about? When you do it, do you do tandem repeats of endogenous, is the stuff in the elegans genome or, or foreign? Uh, usually with fluorescent proteins. So like if we try to uh, CRISPR in like a 2x GFP construct, we'll get lines that have one, two, three, four copies, for example. Uh, we had, ours, when we sequence our sequ uh, single copy, we usually get, uh, so uh, far, we've only gotten uh, single insertions. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, my second question was, uh, I wondered if you could um, comment on the Q system, which was published a couple of years ago, but hasn't been used that widely, as far as yeah. I know, and, and, and sort of, you know, advantages, disadvantages compared sure. to what you guys have done. Yeah, that was a big question everyone knew was going to get. Um, we haven't done a direct head-to-head comparison. Um, if you... We'd love to give out our system, and if you guys have any experience with Q, we'd love to know your feedback. Um, I think it, in terms of expression strength, it'll be 
as good. Um, in terms of functionality, Q is nice in that it has um, temporal control using uh, quinic acid. Um, ours you can kind of do because you can, you will be able to do because we have split, so you can use a cell type of interest and split it with heat shock. And we have, we've tried that and actually we do get some induction, it seems to work. Um, so that would be, I think, the only real difference. Um, I think we have a lot of strains available and ready to ship out if you want to try anything. I'm not sure about Q though. But, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks okay. Thank you.